My research project began with this picture. Children in a rural village in the Vidarbha region of the state of Maharashtra, India, sit around a photograph of their father, a farmer who had recently committed suicide. It almost looks like the children were forced to sit in this way and refrain from smiling. It makes me wonder what purpose the photograph was originally taken for. But either way, it makes a pretty strong impression on me. For someone like me, whose family left a very similar looking village setting hardly two generations ago when my grandfather decided to leave his family's roots behind and start a business in the closest major town, I'm always reminded that even today I could have easily been the subject of a photograph such as this. But I'm not. Having come to America now, I grapple with how the dollars that I pump into this economy due to my consumption practices and the knowledge I gain from a prestigious Ivy League and deemed to be true could have unintentional adverse effects on the lives of these villagers in my home country. And so I decided that the first step would be to find out about the technological, economic, sociocultural, and political forces behind the globalization of the seed industry, and understand why a term like globalization that's described by the source we all love, Wikipedia, as a process by which the people of the world are unified into a single society and function together, is a definition that's clearly lacking, as I am yet to see similar pictures of children of those who work in the companies that run the seed industry. Within minutes, any generic Google search on the seed industry and its giants will bring you to Monsanto. From humble beginnings in 1982, when scientists working for the original Monsanto were the first to genetically modify a plant cell, the American Agricultural MNC now has more than 250 seed partners in the United States and North America and operates in 61 countries worldwide under multiple brand and product names by acquiring local companies in international locations and licensing seed germplasm and by biotechnology traits to them. It is also by far the leading producer of genetically engineered seed, holding 70 to 100 percent market share for crops including corn, soybean, alfalfa, and canola. Monsanto's presence in India began over 50 years ago in 1949, and due to pressure in the last few decades from the World Bank's structural adjustment policies to restrict trade barriers that were in place to assure farmers' rights and plant varieties, the company has now gained a significant share of the emerging billion-dollar seed market in India. India faces a shortage of edible oil, wheat, and rice, and imports up to 40% of these crops annually to compensate. Monsanto asserts that increased yields are the core of their agenda, and that through increasing the use of hybrid seeds and biotechnology, the increased productivity will allow farmers to produce more with the same or fewer inputs of energy and pesticide. It seems like the perfect solution to India's food challenge. Imagine that, Monsanto says. Well, I want you to imagine this. Since 1997, over 182,000 farmers have taken their lives and the numbers continue to rise. According to a recent study by the National Crime Records Bureau in India, 46 Indian farmers kill themselves every day. That's roughly one suicide every 30 minutes. Many of them kill themselves by drinking the same pesticide that they took huge loans out to buy after discovering too late that growing the seeds alone without any additional inputs from the company such as specialized fertilizer and pesticide would not produce the higher yields that were promised. This has devastating implications for an agricultural sector that employs about 240 million farmers countrywide. Vandana Shiva, once a nuclear scientist turned environmental activist, runs a research foundation in India for science, technology, and ecology called Navdanya, and talks here about the foundation's work to minimize the effect of seed biotechnology on Indian farmers. It came really from an ethical urge to defend life's evolution, life's diversity, and the freedom of life to reproduce, to multiply, to be able to just be distributed. Because I could see that this would create a new kind of scarcity, which it has. Today, 150,000 farmers in India have committed suicide in areas where seed has been destroyed, where they have to buy the seed from Monsanto and buy it every year at very, very high cost. And that high cost seed is getting them into debt, and that debt is pushing them to suicide. What we've done is create community seed banks, places where we collect and save seeds, rescue them from disappearance, 
multiply them and then distribute them according to farmers needs and about 40 community seed banks have been created across the length and breadth of India places where these have been created farmers are not in distress because the biggest cost today is seeds and chemicals these seed banks have now been a new place where we can respond to the new crisis of globalization on the one hand and climate change on the other globalization has led to farmers suicides we are able to take seeds to these suicide zones and distribute the seeds so that farmers can break out of that dependency grow food crops get out of debt we've been able to create community seed banks to deal with climate change with the extreme flooding the new droughts the cyclones the hurricanes that lead to salinization and today for us the work on seed has become the place from where we are responding to the worst tragedies and the worst crises of our times it is important to understand the impact of biotechnology on the life of the natural seed and how its value has transformed in the power shift from farmers to agricultural corporations as producers of seed. In his book First the Seed, Jack Kloppenberg deems that crop production is the necessary foundation upon which the complex structures of human society have historically been raised and the seed is the irreducible core of crop production. Hence, capitalist accumulation is based on a foundational separation of the worker from the the means of production, allowing for commodification of the seed. The natural characteristics of the seed normally constitute a biological barrier to its commodification, and so capitalist powers have appeared to pursue two distinct but related means leading to the commodification of the seed. First, scientific techniques have been used to make the seed amenable. RDNA transfer and protoplasts facilitate bypassing sexual reproduction and moving genes between completely unrelated organisms. Consequently, there is ecological incompletion of the seed because the seed is unable to reproduce by itself and only produces with the help of purchased inputs, i.e. fertilizer, pesticides, farm machinery, etc. The second method used by agriculture corporations to establish commodification is to privatize communal knowledge through intellectual property right protection. Gaining control over prior wealth of indigenous farming knowledge that has sustained ecological diversity and equilibrium before the onset of biotechnology. As Pat Mooney accurately declares in his book, Development Dialogue, the perception that intellectual property is only recognizable when produced in laboratories by men in lab coats is fundamentally a racist view of scientific development.